Hello board game brothers and sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching on Kickstarter and GameFound over the next week. If you're new here, we do this every single week going over all the upcoming campaigns, so if you want to stay up to date, this is the place to be. But before I get started, I do like to go over some news and announcements that I just found out about over the past week. And I do have a big one for you because a new expansion was just announced for Cthulhu Death May Die, and this is the Forbidden Reaches expansion. And if you were worried about getting your hands on the Godzilla miniature that was being released as a promo at different conventions, well, I hope you didn't go ahead and buy it on eBay for the ridiculous prices because it looks like it will be offered in this campaign. And I do have some mixed feelings about yet another expansion for this game because this is a game that already has a ton of content out for it. And I do have it all because this is probably in the top five games of all time for me. It's definitely my favorite cooperative game. And still with all that being said, I don't really feel like I need more content for this game. I just had the previous season's content just come in the mail and there is a lot there on top of everything that I already have. And I am part of the problem here because I probably still will back this one because it is a game that I like so much. I tend to be a little bit more lenient with those ones. It's pretty hard to pass up Godzilla in the game but it looks like this expansion is also going to be including a bunch of new content that you can just mix into the game and something that I do like with what I'm seeing here is that this looks like it's going to be taking players to new locations specifically those locations that are a little bit more supernatural and I hope they did their research and will be relating these different locations to the actual locations from the different stories. Not a whole lot more info on this one other than what you can gather from these images here but I will be covering this in more detail during the week of its launch so if you do want to know what exactly this is adding to the game, feel free to subscribe down below and I will give you all the details as soon as they become available. As always, I do want to give a quick mention to Alex over at Board Game Co because him and I do work together keeping track of all these upcoming campaigns. I put these videos together for you each and every week, but Alex puts out a video at the start of each month going over the entire month and letting you know of the heavy hitters that you can expect. So if you do want to see what we're still looking forward to here in the month of November, he does already have the video up for that, but he does also offer a whole variety of different content, doing dedicated reviews and previews, and also just letting you know of what he thinks about various campaigns and if they're worth your money, or if you should just wait for retail or something in between. I do also want to mention Mike over at Zillow Blitz because he covers a whole genre of games that Alex and I don't cover in near as much detail, and these are the historical war games, so if that is an area that you're interested in, Mike also posts up a video each month letting you know of the upcoming war games, so if you want even more comprehensive coverage of all the games to expect, you do want to check out his channel as well, and I will have both of these channels linked in the description down below. But that's it for an intro, and we do have quite a few games launching this week, so let's check them out. And the first campaign we have is launching on November. 12th and this one is called Avalon the Riven Vale and this is the next game coming from Shadowborn Games that brought you the game Oathsworn which was quite a hit in the community. But this one's going a completely different direction because rather than a cooperative narrative adventure game this one is actually a competitive area control that does have a few unique twists that makes it quite a bit different from any other area control games that you might have played. As you might have guessed from the name here, this one is an Arthurian area control game that takes place in Avalon, so you're going to see things like the Holy Grail, Excalibur, King Arthur, Merlin, Mordred, and other characters that I'm a little less familiar with, but at the start of the game, players are going to be choosing a faction that they want to play as, with a leader character that's going to be one of these more familiar characters, then you're going to have a bunch of other units that you'll be able to control as well. The game also allows you to choose whether you want to play it with asymmetrical or symmetrical faction action powers and something that's really neat about playing with the asymmetrical powers is that each of the different factions does have a specific goal that they're trying to achieve and if you are able to achieve that goal then you're going to be flipping your board to the other side upgrading your faction and your character into a more powerful form. As I mentioned this game does take place on the island of Avalon but at the start of the game this whole island is going to be covered in mist represented by having all the different location tiles face down and players having to explore them in order to to reveal whatever they might have on them. In order for players to take actions, they're going to be using action cards of four different types. There are your movement cards, your deployment cards, your settlement cards, and your combat cards, and each of these are going to be offered in a different color, and each of them are going to be offering you different abilities or effects within their respective categories. These do also have a cost in order to play their effects, and what's really neat about this is that you're going to be paying for that cost with your other cards. So you're going to have to decide which ones you want to use or keep for a 
following turn, and which ones you're willing to sacrifice as currency. Each round, players are going to be choosing one of these cards that they want to play, and then everyone is going to reveal their cards simultaneously. These cards do also have a numeric value on them, and you're going to be comparing those values in order to determine who has the most initiative, and then that player is going to be able to take their action first. Players are normally going to be deploying their units to the perimeter of the board and then using movement actions to move further into the center of Avalon, because it's these more central locations that are going to be offering you more victory points if you are able to maintain control of those regions. But as players explore these different locations, if you move into a location that is still showing its missed side, you're going to be flipping that tile to the other side, revealing the benefits that it offers, but also the amount of victory points it grants for controlling it because this is variable across the tiles. And then you're also going to be gaining a card because each of the unexplored areas is also going to have a card assigned to it, adding even more variability into the game. And these cards can either offer you new gear, which you can assign to your different unit types, or they could be offering you different creatures that you can actually tame and bring into your team as one of your units. And of course, this world isn't going to be so kind to just grant you with those cards as soon as you reveal them. And instead, if it's an item, you'll have to win a battle in that location in order to claim that item for yourself. And the items are really nice because you can assign them to your different types of units in order to give them various upgrades. But if it's a creature, then all gameplay is going to temporarily pause. And then players are going to be entering into a bidding round where you're going to be using your action cards in order to bid for control of that creature. This is yet another way that you can use your action cards, but also another way that you can just burn through them. The turns continue like this until the end of the round, and then you're going to be moving into a war phase where you're going to be resolving each of the different locations, rewarding victory points for the players that have the most presence there. If multiple players have units in the same location, then you're going to be comparing the strength by adding up the strength of the various units there, but then each player is also going to be able to play a combat card from their hand if they're able to, which is going to grant them with some sort of special effect in that battle. And then you can also use any of your other cards as support to add even more strength to your side, but you can only use one card of each color. After all of that is said and done, if you have the first, second, or third amount of influence in that location, you're going to be gaining the amount of victory points depicted on that location's tile. And then the game plays over three seasons like this, and of course the player with the most victory points at that time wins. But there are some other things that you can do to try and tip the scales in your favor because there is going to be a bunch of different prophecy cards that will appear throughout the game, and players can try to complete these different objectives across these cards in order to move up on the favor track. This gains you favor with the Lady of the Lake, which can grant you some instant bonuses as you move up that track, but also the player with the most favor is the one that's going to gain access to Excalibur, which is one of the more powerful items offered in the game. If this one sounds interesting to you, definitely check it out, and of course you can click to get notified to make sure that you don't miss out on the free gift if you do back this on day one. And also on the 12th, we have an abstract strategy game for one to four players, and this one's called Tatsumi. And what's really neat about this one is that it actually uses the insert as the board. But this one is a campaign that I thought was launching a couple weeks ago, so I did already offer coverage for this one. So I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage for you now. And this one looks like a really interesting abstract strategy game where the main board is actually made out of a plastic insert with randomly assigned rings. On each edge of the board, there's going to be different objective cards with different sets of rings that you're going to be trying to complete and then move over to that card in order to fulfill that card and take those rings into your possession. The way this works is that each player is going to be controlling a dragon out on the board, and on your turn you can move it in any orthogonal direction, as many spaces as you'd like. Wherever you stop, you can then collect two rings rings from any two adjacent spaces, and like I said, you're going to be trying to collect the appropriate rings in order to fulfill the various sets that are out on these different objective cards. Players take turns continuing like this until a player has enough rings to create a set to complete one of those cards, and in order to complete it, they need to move their dragon all the way to that side of the board, and then use their action to complete that card. The reason you want to do this is because any rings you use to fulfill that card, you can then put on your own personal player board. 
every time you add rings to your board, you're gonna be scoring based on the biggest group of each color. So you're gonna be trying to put these rings in strategic locations to create as many big groups as possible. The game continues like this until you reach the end of the game. And what's really interesting at this point is that you're gonna be going through a final scoring. And the scoring is still based on your personal player board, but it works a little bit differently because instead you're gonna be scoring for each of the colors against the outside edge of the board. This is gonna create a few different Different goals that players are trying to go for throughout the game and the game does allow you to optionally play with asymmetrical special abilities for each dragon if you do want to change it up a bit and add a little bit of variety. If this one sounds interesting to you, you can go ahead and check it out and I will have it linked down below. This next one is also launching on the 12th and it is also a campaign that I did already cover but this one is for Dungeons of Doria and this is going to be a reprint for the game which is a cooperative dungeon crawler but this is also going to be introducing a new expansion as well and if you do want to learn more about this one like I said, I did cover it already, so I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage for you now. If you're not familiar with this original game, this is a cooperative dungeon crawler that can be played both as one-off scenarios, or you can play through the several included campaigns that are going to be stringing several scenarios together. The new expansion is going to be adding a bunch of new playable characters, new monsters, gear, spells, and traps that you can just go ahead and mix into the game, but there's also going to be all these monster modifier cards that you can combine with any monster to create nearly endless amounts of unique monster combinations and to make those monsters just a little bit more difficult. There's also going to be a new campaign added into the game as well as a bunch of new scenarios. But as I mentioned, this is a cooperative game and players are going to be playing as different characters with different stats and abilities as well as different restrictions as to what gear and items they can use. Players are going to be using actions to move around out on the board and discover new areas with each new area potentially adding new monsters onto the board. Players are also going to be using actions to fight and defeating monsters can gain you with additional experience points as well as new loot and items that you can use to upgrade your character but using those experience points to upgrade your stats. Turn order in this game is determined by the players and the enemies different initiative values and the enemies initiative values will just be a predetermined value whereas each of the characters can actually have a different value from round to round. And this is a really interesting aspect of this game because on your turn you're going to be rolling dice and then combining that with your stats in order to determine the amount of initiative that you have. What's cool about this is that this game utilizes exploding dice so any values that roll a zero you're actually going to be able to roll two more dice adding those results onto your overall roll and if any of those are zeros you're just going to be doing that over again which can actually create quite huge combos where you're getting quite a lot of initiative which is really nice because your initiative also doubles as your action points. You're going to be using those action points to move around on the board, collect loot, interact with different items and mission objectives using skill checks, and of course also to fight different enemies. Combat in this game is determined by rolling dice in combination with either your attack or defense value depending on which side of the attack you're on. And this also uses the exploding dice mechanism adding a little bit more excitement into the combat. And if you are able to reach certain thresholds of damage, you can actually deal additional critical damage on top of your base amount. But the game continues like this as players play throughout those different scenarios and try to complete their mission objectives. And if you are able to do that, you win the game. But if any of the players are defeated, then all the players lose. If you want to check this one out, I will have it linked down below. And of course, you can click to follow along with this campaign and get notified once it launches. Also launching on the 12th, we have Storyfold Wildwoods. And this one is a solo narrative adventure game. And what's really cool about this is that it does use a storybook to guide you through the campaign. But the storybook also does double as the game board. The story in this game is that a literal darkness has been overtaking the forest and you're going to play as Luma and her bear Brom in order to set out and bring light back to the forest and save the creatures that reside there. You're going to be playing through multiple scenes which each provide their own narrative, unique set of rules, and win and loss conditions, and your success or failure there will impact the next scene that you will be playing through. In order to take actions, you're going to be rolling dice, and then you're going to be using those dice to activate various river cards at the bottom of the board. The really cool thing about the way this works is that you can just go ahead and choose which of these cards you want to activate depending on what you're trying to accomplish at that point in the game. But then you're going to be rolling dice and then for each success you roll you'll be able to activate that card that many times. The challenge here is that the further the card is to the right of the river, the more difficult it will be to get a success. 
This also makes it more difficult to perform the same actions over again in quick succession because whenever you do choose a card to activate, it's going to be moving to the most right location of that row, pushing all the other cards over. The different actions can allow you to explore different locations, which are variable depending on the scene that you're currently in, and these can offer different effects and creatures affected by the darkness, and your other actions are going to allow you to heal, help, or provide light to those creatures. And then after you've performed the actions that you can, you're going to be going into the shadow phase, where all the creatures still affected by the shadow are going to activate and cause negative effects to you, which can reduce your spirit, and if this happens too much, you can eventually become overwhelmed in darkness, which can cause you to lose the game, but if that doesn't happen then you're going to be continuing through the story arc down the paths that you're set upon towards your specific ending. And if this one does sound interesting to you, you can go ahead and check it out and I will have it linked down below. Also launching on November 12th we have World Order which is the next game coming from the same team that brought you the game Hegemony which is currently ranked number 61 on Board Game Geek, which is really impressive considering this game was just released in 2023 and it's been making quite a splash and working its way up the rankings. Although there is a shared theme here this one is going to be very much its own game and it's going to play quite a bit differently than hegemony because this one is a competitive deck building area control game i can't say for sure if this one's going to be as well received because reaching number 61 on board game geek is a very difficult thing to do but i do think this one will be talked about and i think it does look like a really solid design because in this game players are going to be playing as different countries and you're going to be trying to gain influence in different ways throughout the world represented by different cubes in those regions. When you're able to put your influence cubes in these regions, you're going to be able to choose if you want to put it in the top section or the bottom section. And the bottom section is worth more points, but it does come with a few risks because this section doesn't score unless the top section is completely full. And also when you put your cubes in the top section, they are guaranteed to stay there for the rest of the game. But in the bottom section, there is actually no limit to the amount of times a cube can be put there. And as it reaches its limits, the cubes that were put their earliest are going to be knocked off going back to that player. The game plays over six rounds with two scoring phases. There's one at the end of the third round and then one at the end of the game. And of course you're trying to get the most victory points in order to win. Players are going to be using action cards of different types in order to take their various actions in this game. But what's really interesting about this is that each player also starts with the number of allied country cards. And these not only limit the locations that you're able to take certain actions, but you're also going to be using and flipping these cards in conjunction with your action cards in order to augment those actions in different ways. Is. Each round players are going to be drawing six of these cards from their deck and then taking turns just playing one at a time until each player has played four cards. What's cool about this is that the remaining cards that you didn't play are going to be granting you with points in order to buy new cards and also granting you with money that you can use to perform or augment different actions. The different cards are broken into different categories depending on the type of effects they have. There's diplomatic actions, economic actions, military actions, or domestic actions. There's a whole variety of different effects and abilities that these cards can have, but like I said, the main thing you're trying to do is get influence cubes out on the different regions of the board, and the main ways that these cards allow you to do that is through either diplomacy, where you're going to be spending any diplomacy that you've earned in order to place a cube in an allied country, or instead you could do it through an investment into to an allied country which also allows you to place a cube there and it also does generate you interest from that country in future rounds. The other main way that you can place these influence cubes is by building a military base in an allied country. Whenever you do that, you're also going to be paying money to place tanks and cubes in that country. But like I said, these action cards can do a lot of different things and they could even allow you to move these tanks around to different regions, which can be really helpful to you since they can subtract points from other players or even act as tiebreakers when checking for a majority. And there's also cards that can help you improve relations with other countries that maybe you aren't allied with in order to eventually ally with giving you even more options and combinations to use those cards with your action cards. Some effects can also allow you to purchase ability cards which not only give you ongoing abilities but also victory points for the end of the game. And of course action cards can also offer you a bunch of different ways to either generate or convert resources into other resources such as your money, your diplomacy, or the different commodities that you'll be using in a variety of different ways. 
If this one sounds interesting to you, definitely check it out and I will have it linked in the description down below. Also launched on the 12th, we have the next game coming from Kids Table Board Games and this one is called Layers. And this one's really interesting because it's a two player game where each player is gonna be creating a dungeon for the other player to try and explore. Players are gonna be building their dungeons simultaneously and each player is gonna be starting with the same number of walls, traps, treasures, and monster tokens that they're gonna be using in order to create their dungeons. Another thing that's really cool about this is that as you play the game over multiple plays, you're going to be unlocking new components and new monsters that you're going to be able to mix into the game, adding even more variety and more layers of complexity as you get more familiar with the game. The players are going to be building their dungeons behind a screen, and whichever player finishes their dungeon first is going to decide which of the players has to explore the other player's dungeon first. The way this works is that the exploring player is going to be using a pad of paper with a grid on it to represent the dungeon, and then the opponent's going to tell them their starting location and kind of act as dungeon master telling them what they see and discover as they move through the different locations in that dungeon. You can track all this information on your pad of paper as you discover it and your goal here is to try and score the most victory points and the way that you're going to be doing that is by defeating monsters, finding chests, and being first to leave the dungeon. The thing is you can't actually leave the dungeon until you've either defeated three monsters, found three chests, or done two of each of those. In order to move around the dungeon and take different actions you're going to be spending action cubes and once all of those have run out that's going to be the end of your turn and then your opponent is going to be doing the same thing and then it'll come back to you. You're going to have a number of these cubes that you can spend and you can spend one action cube in order to move one space and whenever you do that you're going to be moving the cubes over to the spent space on your board. You might notice that there's a few different colors of cubes here and the white ones are just your generic cubes they don't have any special effects but the green cube can be used to actually peek into a room before you move into it which can allow you to discover traps or monsters instead of just being ambushed by them while the yellow cube can actually allow you to move three spaces in one action but you will stop if you run into a monster or a trap Alternatively, you can also do either of these actions by spending two white cubes, but of course this is generally less efficient. If you find a chest, you're going to be drawing a random treasure card from the treasure deck, but then you're also going to be choosing a treasure card from a market, which is going to have a number of these out on display. These can grant you with different special abilities, but can also be used for victory points at the end of the game with a few options of set collection. But if you happen to walk into a monster or a trap instead, these can have all sorts of different negative effects that can be inflicted on you, with the most basic being dealing some amount of damage. Whenever this happens, you're going to be fatiguing some of your action cubes, which causes them to move into the fatigued space on your board. And the reason you don't want this to happen is because it's going to take two turns to get those cubes back, because at the start of your turn, all your cubes move one space to the left, and the fatigued space is the furthest on the right you can be on your board. Luckily, if you do still have cubes left when you run into that monster, you can actually spend those cubes in order to get an equivalent amount of dice. And you can roll those dice in order to deal damage, or even sometimes roll those dice to disarm a trap. As I mentioned, the more that you play the game, the more new components and different types of monsters and traps and opportunities you're going to be including into the game, so there is a lot more to be discovered here. But the game essentially continues like this until one of the players meets the requirements to leave the dungeon, and then they find the end of the dungeon. At that point, they're going to be gaining four points for being the first one to leave, and then the other player has one turn to also leave the dungeon, and then if they're both able to do that, it's the player with the most victory points that wins, and if you do want to check this one out, I will have it linked down below. And of course, you can click to get notified once this one launches. Also on the 12th, we have Starlock, which is a miniatures war game, which is a genre that I don't normally dive into as deep, but what makes this one unique is that this one's a survival miniatures war game. In this game, players are going to be playing as different prisoner factions on a prison planet, and at the start of the game, players are going to be drafting their units and building their teams, and then the game offers a few different modes of play where you can either fight against the other players or work cooperatively in order to try and escape the planet. Players will be harvesting resources from the planet in order to deploy more units or take special actions with them, or even to repair or power their individual ships. The game offers a whole bunch of different maps and setups with different terrains that can have some different effects, a whole bunch of different shipboards that are repaired in different ways or have different effects and abilities to take advantage of. And since all the players are prisoners here, you do have the shared enemy of the prison guards, which will put a stop to any of the efforts that they become aware of. 
If you want to learn more about this one, I will have it linked down below. Also on the 12th, we have Ballads and Tales Journey of the Brave, and this one is a solo cooperative or one versus many dungeon crawler game that blurs the lines between a board game and an RPG. In order to play this game, you're going to be choosing one of the many scenarios, which can take you through different dungeons, ruins, forests, or villages, and there's going to be different event cards and monsters and monster weapons that are going to be drawn and combined in different ways in order to create all sorts of different permutations to make each game very different than the last. As I mentioned, this can be played fully cooperatively, but if you want to, one player can also act as the game, playing for all the different monsters and different events that are going to be getting in your way, and there will also be final bosses that you'll have to go up against, and different scenario objectives that you're going to be trying to complete. And if the players are able to do that, then they win the scenario, but I don't have a whole lot more info on this one, so if that does sound interesting to you, you can go ahead and check it out and I will have it linked down below. And also launching on November 12th, we have the next game offered from Buttonshy Games, and this one is called The Glass Garden. And this one's a fun little solo game where you're going to be growing succulents in a jar, but unfortunately for you, there is also a little critter in there nibbling away at your plants and potentially costing you victory points at the end of the game. The game offers a few different critters of variable difficulty, and you're going to be picking one of those to play for each game. And then there are a bunch of different succulent and jar cards that can grant you with special abilities. And you're going to be taking advantage of those to try and grow as many succulents as possible. And I do want to thank the publisher here because they were kind enough to send me a prototype copy of the game, so rather than just explaining how this game plays, I can actually go ahead and show you. I'm going to be playing with the snail here, which is the second easiest critter to play with, and the reason I chose the snail is because the fly does not deal any damage, and I did want to show you how that mechanism actually works. The critter starts on the leftmost side of your jar, and then each turn it's going to be moving one space forward until it eventually reaches the end of your jar, and once it can't move any further, that's going to be triggering the end of the game. Like I said, you're going to be trying to grow as many succulents as possible because each one's going to be worth a victory point, but it can be worth two victory points if it's in as best health as possible. The way that you grow a succulent is with these different plant cards located in the center here. At the start of the game, these are all going to be face down on the soil side, and if you're able to meet the requirements in the center of the card, you're going to be flipping that over, indicating that that succulent has been grown. The health of the succulent is actually indicated by the row that it's in, and there's actually three different rows here, and and they all start in the center. But if you're able to move this to the top, then that's going to be the healthiest state, making it worth two points. But if it's in either the center or the bottom, then it's only going to be worth one point. Succulents can't get any more damaged if they are on the bottom row, so you don't have to worry about losing them. It just makes them a little bit more harder to get them to the top. In order to meet a requirement of a card, you just have to get those three icons adjacent to each other across three neighboring cards anywhere within the row as long as it isn't divided by the critter. You might have noticed that there's icons on the top and bottom of these cards, and in order for those to be considered adjacent to each other, they do need to be on the same row. So for example, these two blue cubes would currently be considered adjacent to each other, but if I were to slide this up, those would no longer be adjacent, and instead this lightning bolt would be adjacent to this cube. There's also a special ability on these cards as well as some icons which are grayed out, and that's just letting you know what is on the other side of this card, because if I were able to flip this card, these grayed out icons now become available, and you can see that because they're colored in here, and then the special ability instantly gets activated. These six jar cards on either end here are not just here for looks, because these can actually grant you with additional actions after the game is ended, giving you even more opportunities to score victory points, and the way that you take advantage of those is by trying to flip cards adjacent to them, because if I was able to flip this card to its succulent side while it's adjacent to a jar card, then the jar card is also going to flip to its lit up side, indicating that I do get to take an extra move at the end of the game. This means that throughout the game I'm going to be trying to manipulate these to get other cards adjacent to the jars that I haven't flipped yet, in order to flip those over and get those extra actions as well. The way a turn works is all outlined on the critter card, and it says here that I get to take two actions, and my options are to slide a card up or down, or to shift a card to the right any amount of spaces, so long as it doesn't pass the critter card. If I meet the requirements of any of the succulents, I can then flip them over, resolving their effects, and then the critter is going to cause damage to the closest plant on the right side of this card, and the way that that's indicated is by sliding that card down. And then the critter is just going to move one space to the right and then flip over. 
The neat thing about this is that it does slightly alter the turn depending on which way that the snail is facing. So I think we're all good to just jump into the game now and I'm going to be taking my two actions. But before we do that, I did want to point out that I did notice we were lucky enough to get these two blue cube icons side by side. And the third one is located down here. So if we're able to get these all adjacent to each other, that will actually allow us to meet the requirement of this card way over here. So I think that's what we're going to try to do. And we are able to do that with the two actions that we have. For my first action, I'm going to be sliding this card to the right into a new column, and we do have a few options here. I can either put it to the left of the other two icons, in between them, or on the right of them. Either option will work, but because this one also has a water icon on it, I probably want to try and get this beside another water icon because that'll help us meet this requirement later. And there is an icon in this card here, so I think I'm going to be sliding this one into this column. And that was just our first action, so we still do have one left. And for that, I'm going to be sliding this card upward into the topmost row, because that's going to get these three icons adjacent to each other, which now meets the requirement of this card. So we can just go ahead and flip that one over. And that's going to be instantly activating this card's special ability. And we have to activate it. We don't have a choice, but it says to shift one plant to a different column on the same side of the critter and then place it in the topmost row. And I think the card I'm going to pick for that is this one here that we looked at before because I do plan to flip this one very soon since we already do have some water icons lined up. And I wouldn't mind sliding this one all the way to the right here and to the top because if we're able to flip this one while it's adjacent to this jar card, that's going to allow us to flip this jar card to its opposite side, granting us with extra actions at the end of the game. So that's going to slide all of these cards over, and then we're just going to be following exactly what it says on this critter card. We have to damage the closest plant on the right, which is going to send this one down. And then we're going to shift this one right and flip it to the other side. And I'm realizing now that I probably could have been a little bit more efficient with my actions here, but that's okay. We'll just roll with it. And lucky for me, because the snail has flipped to its other side, that actually changes the actions that I have available to me. And rather than sliding any card to a new column to its right, I can now slide any card to its left. So I think what I'm going to do is take this card and slide it over here. And then I'm going to do something a little unexpected here and slide this card up, which actually gets these three lightning bolts adjacent to each other, which meets the requirement of this card. So this card is going to be flipping over to its succulent side. And this forces us to use that ability, which says to swap the two edge plants and then place one in the top row and one in the bottom row. So let's go ahead and do that and flip these two cards. And I think I'm going to put this one in the top row and this one in the bottom. And the reason I chose to do it that way is because the snail is now going to be damaging the closest plant on its left hand side. And since plants in the lowest row can no longer be damaged, this actually is going to be doing nothing for the snail. So it's just going to be shifting one right and then flipping over to its other side. And for my two actions, I'm going to be doing something a little controversial here and bringing this card back down, but then I'm going to be sliding this card up. This gets us our three water icons adjacent to each other, which is going to meet the requirements of this card, which flips that over, which is then going to be flipping this jar card over. And as I mentioned, that's really nice for us because this is going to give us an extra action at the end of the game. But now we have to go ahead and perform the special ability of this card, which says to swap two plants in the same row. For that, I think I'm going to go ahead and swap these two, which I will explain in a moment here. But before I do that, the snail is going to deal one damage to the closest card on its right, so that'll slide down. Then it's going to be shifting one space over and flipping to its other side. Now we can continue with my master plan here, which is to use an action to slide this card up and our other action to slide this card down, which gets these three mountain icons adjacent to each other. This is going to allow us to flip this card over to its other side, which is going to force this ability, which says to swap two neighboring plants and then place both in the middle row. And for cards to be neighboring, they don't need to be in the same row, they just need to be in neighboring columns. But in this case, they are in the same row because I'm going to swap these two cards, which I'm doing basically just to get them both moved down because I want to get these three icons lined up in my next turn. But now the snail is going to damage the closest plant to its left. And in this case, that plant is already on the bottom, so it can't be damaged. But when this happens, it's actually going to be looking at 
the next card over, which can be damaged. So this one is going to be sliding down. And then this is going to be flipping over to its other side. And I was going to slide this card up in order to get these three icons adjacent to each other, but I have had a bit of a change of heart here. And I think what I'm going to do instead is slide this card up. And the reason that I want to do this is because this snail is now going to damage this card, which is going to slide it down. And then these are going to swap and then the snail is going to flip over to its other side. And this automatically puts these three icons in order for us, which is going to be resolving this card, which will then allow us to flip it over, including this jar card here. That's not going to happen until I first take my two actions, which are optional to take, but I will definitely be taking them. And I think I'm going to use those to push this card up twice into the healthiest position, assuming that I will be able to flip this over to its succulent side before the end of the game, which I am definitely able to do because I do have a ace up my sleeve here, because now that I've taken my two actions, we can then resolve these three icons, which we have in a row here. And this allows us to flip this card over which also flips over this jar card, which is really nice for us. But now we have to activate the special ability here, which says swap two plants in different rows, exchanging their exact positions. And this is where I'm going to get really cheeky because I'm going to be swapping this card with the card that we just flipped because this card has a plant icon on the bottom of it, which now gets these three icons in a row which is exactly what we need in order to flip this card over. So let's go ahead and do that, which also flips over this jar card. And now that we have to perform this special ability, which says swap one edge plant with one non edge plant. And I think I'm going to go ahead and use that to swap these two cards, which unfortunately our snail is now going to damage, but then it's going to be flipping over here and flipping to its other side. But for my next action, I'm going to slide these two cards back up, which gets these three icons in a row, which is now going to be flipping this card. And that allows us to shift any card to any other column and put it in any row in that column. So I'm going to slide this one over here. Then the snail is going to damage this card, move over and flip over to the other side. For our two actions, we'll slide this one up twice, which gets those three icons in a row, which is going to allow us to flip this card. This is going to allow us to swap any two neighboring plants and then place them in any row, which is great for us. We can just go ahead and swap these two and then place them both in the top row because that's going to make them both worth two victory points at the end of the game. But now the snail is going to damage this plant, slide over, and flip over to the other direction. For our two actions, I'll slide this one up and then I will slide this one up. And now the snail wants to move forward, which it can no longer do. So that's gonna be triggering the end of the game. But before we tally up the score here, we do have a few free actions from the different jar cards that we were able to flip throughout the game. And that's really nice for us because each one of these is gonna allow us to slide a card up or down. And we have three of them, which means that I have three free movements to go one, two, and three. And that is how you max out the score in this game because I just got the highest score which makes me a master gardener but like I said I did play with the second easiest critter and there are much more difficult ones to play with here. But that's how you play the glass garden and I had a lot of fun with this one and I really do love the artwork and the theme here as well so that definitely gives it some extra points in my book. If you enjoyed the little run through here and this looks like a game that you might be interested in as well I do have a link to the campaign in the description down below and of course you can click to get notified. And also on the 12th we have Captain's Log New Horizons and this one is a campaign that I did cover in the past but they pulled that one down and they did a lot more work on the campaign and the game. Now they're bringing it back in a new refreshed version. They've made a lot of changes to the campaign itself but this new version is going to feature a bunch of new modules that you can mix into the game as well as a expansion that also adds even more modules. There's modules that allow you to uncover and explore new species, gain extra benefits to help you along the way, attack, destroy, or conquer different and empires include all sorts of different ships that you can encounter out on the sea. And the Myths and Legends modules are going to allow you to include things like potions, curses, sea monsters, voodoo, and much more. And if you do want to check out this campaign, I will have it linked in the description down below. But like I said, I did already cover the overall gameplay of this one, so I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage for you now. And the goal of this game is to become the most renowned captain in all of history. And the first person to reach a predetermined amount of victory points is going to be the player that achieves that and wins the game. 
And this game actually takes place back in the 15 to 1800s. And this game is considered a sandbox game because almost every part of it is modular and everything can be mixed up and reconfigured into a different form. It also offers a lot of options to the players so they can move through the game in almost any way they want. And players will be able to choose to start the game between three different ships. There is a fragile but agile ship, a strong and slow ship, or a more well-balanced ship that's a little bit safer if you don't want to take as many risks. But on a player's turn, they're going to be spending action points to do things like move across the board, complete different missions, explore for treasure, visit both legitimate markets as well as illegitimate black markets, and markets do respond to fluctuations in supply and demand, and players will also be able to form and break alliances, fight and board other ships, and there is also a lot of flexibility in how players can upgrade their ships. You'll be able to change the speed, the weapons, the capacity, and the crew, and all of these can completely change your ship from what you began with to something completely new. Another interesting aspect that I think makes this even extra sandboxy is that there is a whole weather mechanism. So players will have to contend with the weather and hopefully use it to their advantage as they deal with the tides and the winds that all come into play. So if you are interested in a sandboxy game with a pirate theme, this is definitely one worth checking out. Links in the description below. And launching on the 13th, we have a new expansion for the game Clans of Caledonia, and this one is the Industry Expansion. And this expansion is going to be adding a bunch of more content that you can just go ahead and mix into the game. There's going to be more faction abilities, more map tiles, and more objective tiles, but also there's going to be a whole new board that you can add into the game that's going to include a whole railway, and you can use that railway to deliver goods to different towns for unique bonuses that those towns offer. Then there's also different farmers markets that have a different way for you to sell your goods in the game for money, and there's also different region milestones that are worth more if you are able to do them first. This also includes a new solo mode, deluxe components, and of course, a new big box solution equipped with all the storage trays you need to store everything that is offered in this game. And I should mention that this one is also my own personal pick of the week because I am a big fan of these classic Euro games. And this one's been around for years now and it's tried, tested, and true and currently ranks number 69 on Board Game Geek, which is not only super impressive, but also kind of funny. But if you're not familiar with this game, this is a competitive Euro game that uses a modular board, and there's going to be a bunch of different clan tiles that can also be used that can add asymmetry across the players and add a little bit of variability from game to game. On your turn, there's a bunch of different actions that you can choose to take. You can either pay money in order to expand your presence out on the board, and whenever you do that, you're going to be taking a unit from your own personal board and then placing it on one of the tiles out on the main board adjacent to a unit that you already have out there. The cost of placing that unit is the sum of the cost outlined on the space you put the unit on, as well as the cost outlined for that unit itself. So you're just going to be adding those two together and then paying that associated cost. This action is really nice because when you take units off your board, you're actually uncovering different production spaces that are going to be producing you different goods for the rest of the game. There's also different benefits for having tokens out on the main board, and some of these can also be used as special resources in order to fulfill contracts, which is another option that you can perform on your turn. And in order to do that, you're going to be spending the resources outlined on the left-hand side of the contract in order to gain the benefits outlined on the right side. And these can grant you with money or special actions, but a lot of the time they're going to be moving you up these various tracks for special resources that can earn you victory points at the end of the game. There's also actions that allow you to buy more contracts, so you can already see there are a bunch of different ways that money is really important in this game. And This is where a really cool mechanism comes into play because you can use actions to place merchant cubes out on this merchant board in order to either buy or sell different resources with each of these columns representing a different resource, but the track for that resource is going to be moving up or down depending on how many of that resource you decided to buy or sell. This creates a really interesting market that's manipulated by the players and you're going to be trying to sell your resources when the value is high and buy them when the value is low. But the final action that you can perform is to simply pass and if you are the player that does this first that's going to be moving you up in the player order and it is also going to be gaining you more money for the following round. 
players gain victory points at the end of the game based on the different objectives that they're able to complete, the number of completed export tiles, any resources or money that they might have left over, as well as their progress up the various import tracks. And the player with the most victory points wins the game. And if you do want to check this one out, I will have it linked down below and you can go ahead and click to get notified once this one launches. And launching on November 14th, we have the next game offered from Awakened Realms, and this one is called Lands of Evershade. This is a cooperative narrative adventure described as a hybrid between a board game and an RPG, because this one's going to be featuring multiple adventures, each taking around 10 to 15 hours to complete, but they're going to be divided into smaller chapters that you're going to be able to play over multiple sessions. The game does offer pre-made characters if you just want to jump straight in, but if you want to have more of that RPG experience, there is also a handbook that guides you through creating your own character, which is going to be made up of a different race, origin, and profession, and you're going to have different values for different starting stats, including your movement. And you're also going to have different starting items and gear and character specific combat cards. And each of these cards are going to have different icons indicating the type of card that they are, and you're only going to be able to have a limited number of each type, which means that you will have to choose between some cards or another. Depending on what it does, it could also have a range or an area of effect, but all these different cards and gear and items that you can assign to your character and even your character itself could have different keywords associated with them that can have different effects as you play throughout the game. You're going to be gaining new gear and items that you can equip to your character, but but then you're also going to be gaining experience points for making different accomplishments that you can then spend to upgrade your character further. You're eventually going to reach a point where you've fully maxed out your character, and once you get there, this actually gives you the option to take them on one of the many epic deadly scenarios. This is optional to do, so if you feel like your character's had enough and you want to roleplay them a little bit differently, you can also just choose to retire them and then start a new character. But as I mentioned, in order to play this game, you're going to be choosing one of the adventures, and then that's going to be walking you through the overarching story. You can either choose to read this yourself or use the accompanied app, which will also have professional narration. The game does give you an option to just jump in without even reading the rulebook because there is a tutorial act that's going to be teaching you the game as you play through that act. Of course, each of these adventures is going to have multiple branching paths depending on your successes, failures, and decisions. Some of these decisions might be made as a team, while others might be made by individual players, sometimes even deciding which player makes the decision by the roll of a die. As I mentioned, each of your characters can have different keywords, and depending on which player is interacting with which aspect of the story. The story might indicate that you have to go down a different path depending on the keywords that you currently have in play. As you explore and interact with the different aspects of the world, you're going to have to make different skill checks depending on the different things that you try to do, or maybe even just based on the different situations that you find yourself in. Some of these can be more risky than others, but you're essentially going to be combining your appropriate stats with a dice roll and trying to roll above a certain amount in order to get a success. In some cases, other players can also support you if they do match certain keywords, and in some cases there might be a lot of freedom as to what you can do, whereas in other cases you might have limited options, for example if there are enemies that have appeared out on the board, forcing the players to make decisions as to whether they want to try and flee or maybe just go head on in battle. These cases often take place on different maps where players are going to be alternating between their turn and the enemy's turn with the enemies physically moving around to different locations on that map. There might be some special rules to how the enemy moves and behaves, and if you are forced to engage in battle with them, then that often takes place on a separate board where you're going to be taking turns based on tokens drawn from a bag. You're going to be preloading that bag with black and white tokens according to that specific battle, and then drawing those with the white tokens allowing you to activate any of your team's characters, and then the black tokens forcing you to activate one of the enemy's characters. In the case where a player's character is activated, you're normally allowed to take up to two actions, and these may or may not require skill checks depending on the action that you're performing, but there's a bunch of different basic actions like moving around on the board or healing, and positioning yourself is really important because there could be different obstacles that you can hide behind that can protect you from some potential attacks. 
There could also be some special actions that you can choose from that are only specific to that particular battle. And then there are also your character actions to choose from where you're going to be activating one of your character cards on the right hand side of your board here. And anytime that you do that, you're going to be flipping that card to its opposite side, which usually blocks it out until you meet the requirements to flip it back over. These cards can help you in all sorts of different ways in battle, but they can often be augmented by the different items and gear that you might have in your possession. In the case where an enemy character is activated, you're just going to be following the instructions on their activation card. And if they do end up attacking one of the players, if that player does have a reaction card, they can choose to enact that card in order to try and mitigate whatever the enemy was trying to do to them. Battles continue like this with drawing those tokens and activating either the player's characters or the enemy characters. And if a player's character's health ever goes down to zero, that's going to gain them a injury token. And if you ever do gain three of those then that is not good news because that means that you are going to die. There are some ways to get out of this but more than likely you're gonna to have to create a new character which can enter the game in your next rest phase. There is some good news for the players as well because this game does also include something called fate tokens and you're going to be gaining those usually whenever something bad happens. This is going to allow you to do things like roll dice or manipulate the game in different ways at different opportune moments to try and shift the tides in your favor. This is also a really nice mechanism if you happen to be one of those players that's particularly adept at rolling critical fails because anytime that you do do that in this game, well, that's not going to go well for you, but you do also gain one of these tokens to help you in the future. But the game continues like this until you've either completed the adventure or all the players have died before reaching a rest phase. And that is supposed to be a rare occurrence, but if it does happen and you choose to follow the rules, then that would be ending the game and you would have to start over. If this one sounds interesting to you, you can go ahead and check it out and I will have it linked down below. And also launching on the 14th, we have Pitch Out, which is a competitive dexterity game that has a bunch of different modes of play, but essentially each player is going to have a bunch of different discs as well as a bunch of different walls that they're going to be setting up on their side of the field but each of these discs are going to have different powers associated with them and players are going to be flicking their discs and using those special abilities to try and eliminate the pieces of their opponent. But like I said, there's a bunch of different ways you can play this game and you can definitely get creative adding in your own obstacles or rules in order to mix things up just a little bit more. But essentially the first player to either take out their opponent's leader or all their other pieces is going to be the one to win the game. And if you are interested to check this one out and see what else it has to offer, I will have it linked in the description down below. And launching on November 16th, we have Coffee Up. And this one is a cooperative memory game where players are going to be serving orders of coffee to their customers, trying to remember their names and their usual orders. The game's played with a deck of double-sided customer cards and one side of the card is just going to have the portrait of that customer, but then the other side is also going to have their name as well as their usual order. The game plays over seven rounds with each round representing a day, and each one of those rounds there's going to be a different player acting as the head barista. That player is going to be drawing a number of customer cards depending on the round, and for each customer card that they draw they're going to be reading the name and the order of that customer, and then they're going to be distributing that card to one of the other players. All the players will then be working together to try and fulfill the orders of the various customers and the way that you do that is by pointing to one of the cards in one of the other players hands and then saying either the name of that customer or their order. If you're incorrect then you're going to be losing a star from your cafe's review and if you lose all your stars before the seven days then you lose the game. But if you're feeling particularly familiar with a customer, you can guess both their name and their order, and if you get both of those right, then that's going to be gaining you one of your stars back. The rounds continue like this over the seven rounds, with more customers appearing each round, and if the players make it through the seventh day, then they win the game. And if you do want to check this one out, I will have it linked in the description down below, and of course you can click to get notified. And that is everything for this week, and I am a little ashamed to say that I don't have any giveaways to announce this time around, and with the amount of games that have been launching lately, I should honestly have more giveaways, but it's been a bit of a catch-22 where I've been spending so much time just trying to keep up with all these campaigns, I haven't had enough time to just organize giveaways with publishers, so there is going to be a bit of a lull here. 
but we will get back on track eventually. But for now, let's just go ahead and draw the winners from last week's giveaways, which was for a pledge for the All Play collection, which we did in the comment section. But then we also had a pledge for Monarchs of Camelot and Estate Raise the Realm, which were both run over on the giveaways channel on the Discord. And if you are watching this early enough, you can still feel free to enter those. To draw a winner for the All Play pledge, we're going to be using this fancy application here. And all these extra names down here are bonus entries for my supporters over on Kofi who make all of this possible. And if you are interested in helping out and supporting the channel, I do have a link to that in the description down below and I really do appreciate you checking that out. But we already did draw the comments here, so let's draw the winner. And the winner of the All Play Pledge is Love Has No Logic, which is one of the viewers from the video here. And he said that he's been silently watching that four pack bundle, stalking in the shadows, waiting for his moment to sneak up behind and shout, Booard Games. Congratulations on the win here. You did exactly what you said you would. Just email me at adam at and we'll get that pledge all sorted out for you. Thanks to everyone for entering in on the giveaway and joining in on the fun. That's everything I got for you this week, so until next time, keep that shelf cluttered and the table full. Oh.